everybody. It's Thursday. It's 2 p.m. Eastern. And you know what that means, the latest episode of Bold Leaders in Learning. I'm your host, Brandon Bustee, Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn, Work, Innovation at Kaplan. And I'm excited to have uh, a terrific friend and partner here today, Nathan Hatch, the president of Wake Forest University. Uh, Nathan is uh, a couple of months away from uh, officially retiring but has had an incredible career at Wake Forest and at at several other colleges and universities uh, before that. And today we're gonna be talking about the intentionality of innovation in higher education. There's lots of talk about innovation in higher ed, uh, but Nathan and Wake Forest have done some really interesting things over the year that we're gonna talk about. But before I do that, Nathan, first of all, thanks for joining. Would love to just have you tell some of the folks that are less familiar uh, about your own background and just a little bit about Wake Forest for those who might not know uh, as much about it. Great. Uh, Brandon, thanks uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm a historian by trade and I've been at two institutions. I started teaching history at Notre Dame and then gotten involved in administration and was provost there for nine years before coming here 16 years ago. privileged to be president of Wake Forest. It's ironic that I am interested in innovation because I'm a historian. I studied (laughs) the past, (laughs) but that somehow has been uh, my lot. Uh, Wake Forest is interesting. We've come to call it a collegiate university because we teach like a college and we're relatively small, about 5,000 undergraduates, but we are a full university that has law and medicine and business and Uh, divinity and also uh, division one college sports and we're we're actually the smallest school in a power five conference Atlantic Coast Conference so we in a sense we teach more like a college but we are a university and it's a distinct kind of niche and I think that has served us well I'm a firm believer that in the the broad market of higher education which in in the United States is is a wonderful thing but that you have to focus on your distinctives uh, that is, if, um, if there is no real strategy if competitors are doing the same thing, if you're doing, the, and so I've just had an instinct for that, both at, at Notre Dame and here. And so I do think we've had a distinct niche, um, but it's a curious niche. Wake Forest has been an emerging university. It wasn't a top uh, 30 university 25 years ago, it has become that. And in some ways we are very traditional, but I've come to use the phrase to be radically traditional and radically innovative. I mean, one of the great things about higher education is that it is traditional. I mean, you look 25 years ago at the top corporations in America, today you'd see a completely different list. Right. And yet universities are those durable things. And so tradition is, is important. But at the same time, we are called upon to educate the next generation of leaders. And I think we have to be highly innovative. So I've focused on that to say, where can Wake Forest, um, what what opportunities do we have for innovation? Yeah, and I've I've seen, well, I've heard your expression radically traditional and radically innovative several times. I've heard you speak about it. I've heard you write about it. I think it's a terrific phrase because it does, you know, pay tribute to what has been one of the great strengths of U.S. higher education, right? Which is its tradition and and some of the attributes of it, like uh, shared governance and certain things like that. But at the same time, right, to have this kind of inspirational, forward, horizon-looking view of being innovative as well, you can do both, right? And and so, you know, but but like build on that a little bit, right? So so some of our listeners are probably going, how do you do both of those things, right? Can you do both of those things? Maybe just start by giving us some examples of, you know, your your belief in how that happens. And then maybe, I don't know, an example or two of where there was some tension between the radical, you know, radically traditional and radically innovative uh, edges of that. Yeah, I do think to, to do innovation, I, I would talk about two things. One is finding the right talent. I've never seen a college, a department, or a unit advance without a gifted leader. And so if you're going to innovate, you don't do it with an idea. The right leader makes all the difference. So an example, when when I came to Wake Forest, I was very interested in the whole issue of vocation. How do we help students 
uh, better integrate what they learn to what they will become professionally and how to, so it's not just I will get the job that pays the most, find out who they are and what kind of jobs they should have and then a path to that. And so we did a lot of thinking about that. And, and actually the, the key was finding the right person to lead it. Yeah. And I was introduced through our Dean of Business, Steve Reinemann, to, to Andy Chan, who, who headed career services at Stanford. And so we had Andy come in, we brought him in twice as a consultant, <laughs> trying to recruit him to say, <laughs> come, come and with a kind of blank slate, reinvent personal and career development. So actually we brought, I mean, I'm also a firm believer is that you, you tailor positions around people and not vice versa. Mm -hmm. We brought Andy in as a vice president for personal and career development. And he has, has led a, a remarkable renaissance here. And I think a lot of his ideas have had national import. But uh, to just rethink that, and we, so we start when students are uh, in their first year, to have them think seriously. It's not what I major in, because you can major in history or physics or uh, anything and like become an investment banker or yeah. your major is not your career path. And so to, uh, to help students think about that, actually develop courses in it, to think as seriously about a career path as they are about the academic discipline, which we hope they're in love with. Right. That's, that's uh, one example. I mean, I also think it's that you have to grab opportunities. You, you, you can't innovate in the abstract. Right. And so an, another example was our medical school was taking old tobacco factories in downtown Winston-Salem and using historic tax credits, federal and state, uh, where you could build for about 50 cents on a dollar and taking these and, and making laboratories and offices and classrooms. And over, over a decade, we've done a million square feet. Well, there was space there. Yeah. And increasingly, our science faculty was working with our medical school faculty. We had never had engineering for undergraduates. And so we said, we're going to take space there and we're going to develop an engineering program. It has a strong biomedical engineering flavor working with our medical school. And so we've been able to do that. It's a small tailored kind of program. It has a very much a liberal arts flavor, yep. but that's been an innovation, which we knew we were losing STEM students because of the lack of any kind of engineering. And so that's a, but once again, it was an opportunity that we had. It wasn't something in the abstract. We say, well, we need engineering. It right. Was, uh, th there was an occasion that allowed us to do it. Yeah. Well, I think those are two really good points that, quite frankly, I mean, that I've heard a little bit more about the opportunistic example that you've described in other situations across higher ed, less so about your big point, finding the right talent. And, you know, I think in a lot of organizations, right, we create roles and then we go try and hire somebody. But, you know, in this particular situation that you've described with Andy Chan, and I know Andy well and have been a fan following his work for uh, basically the whole time since he's been at, at Wake Forest. And, um, you know, I mean, you you literally shape the role around a person that you identified as, as being a really entrepreneurial talent. And back to that point of radically traditional and, and radically innovative, you take the, the core of a liberal arts institution, right? And, you know, you invest strategically in career readiness and preparation. You know, those, you know, the liberal arts, right? Radically traditional. And then, uh, you know, oh, this idea of, you know, preparing people for with skills or, you know, vocational thinking or career thinking, like that's a, it's a little bit radically innovative in the context of a, you know, traditional liberal arts campus. But of course, the, the result has been remarkable. I mean, I think Andy shared with me once that uh, that there's now been more than 250 universities that have physically done site visits at Wake Forest to learn more about what Andy and that team have done around career and personal development. So certainly it's had an impact for Wake students. It's had an impact across higher ed. Uh, I know his TED talk on career services must die is probably the most watched TED talk among higher ed career execs. So. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's interesting, you, um, because I'm aware, too, of another position that you created, 
uh, a vice president of innovation role that, uh, that is part of your senior cabinet. Uh, there's other things I would call structural moves that you've made early on. Uh, the other one includes you know, creating a committee on your board of trustees that's dedicated to innovation. So maybe tell me more about those, those couple of things and then we, we'll, we'll keep beating down this theme of opportunistic and talent as well. That happened starting um, almost a decade ago where we and, the, and our trustees said, we need to look hard at everything we're doing. We knew we had certain financial challenges and sort of the challenge we said, how do we, we probably have a $30 million a year shortfall of what we should be doing. And so do we cut, do we increase revenues? And so we, uh, we had consultants in to, to help us go through a process of saying, what's important here? What are our orthodoxies, things that can't be changed? Like we looked at, is it an orthodoxy that we're a small school, but in the ACC? <laughs> right. You know, are, is it an orthodoxy that we don't talk about being purely a research university, we talk about hiring teacher scholars? Right. Uh, we looked at a broad range of things, and out of that came certain innovations. Out of that did come the new engineering program. Out of that came the idea that we should, for a variety of reasons, uh, develop serious programs for high school students. Mm -hmm. And uh, under someone named Todd Johnson, we did that, I think, in innovative ways. It was not just having courses in traditional disciplines. It had more to do with professional tracks. Mm -hmm. It had to do with, and what we found, there would be distinguished professionals at the end of their career who would love to give back. So, uh, for instance, we have a number of medical tracks and you have distinguished physicians who, who love the idea of enticing young people into their kind of medicine. But we, we do that in a variety, a variety of fields, whether law, medicine, finance, uh, journalism. But uh, once again, that, um, those programs do create revenue, but maybe more importantly, they attract students to Wake Forest. Right. A student can come here, even for a week's time, uh, they're much more likely to apply and they're much more likely to, con to confirm uh, if, if they, they, they get into Wake Forest. So out of that came a, a variety of other, just, uh, so, the tr so we had the trustees deeply involved in all this brainstorming and out of mm -hmm. that came the idea, actually from the trustees, should we have an ad hoc committee on innovation? And we had the perfect person in, in Andy Chan, who, I mean, in addition to his career services experience, he had worked as a consultant. And so he was, he became our kind of internal innovative consultant. Mm -hmm. And he, he would staff that trustee committee. And so it's, sometimes it's odd. Sometimes that committee doesn't have a set agenda, mm -hmm. but what they do is so, we try to, brainstorm with them what's happening in higher education, what's new and what's fresh, right. what opportunities do we have? And actually we are just launching this year a new school of professional studies in Charlotte, which is a, a major hub of young professionals. Right. And so the, the innovation committee over the last couple of years has done a lot of hard work and thinking about that, pressing us on What's, what's our business plan for starting that school? Right. Yeah, I, I've always been struck that it's a rather remarkable thing that, uh, that, there, it, there, you, know, that you, you establish this ad hoc committee of the board that's focused on innovation. It's very different than, you know, because I think the other thing a lot of universities confuse are things like tech transfer offices versus what you're talking about here, which is really about any number of innovative ideas the institution might consider, right? degree seeking changes with you know new engineering programs or serving professional audiences in Charlotte with the new professional studies school that you're launching or you know going further upstream and providing valuable Wake Forest uh, education to high school students I mean th there's been a lot that's been part of that so the productivity from this you know committee and from the the talent and people that you've hired and it's interesting you know Todd Johnson who I know as well, he had a very entrepreneurial venture capital driven background. Andy Chan was an entrepreneur in a couple roles before career services and the consulting he did. So 
you know, that that talent theme continues to come up. And um, and so, you know, as you start to think about, uh, you know, where where others in higher ed are trying to go on this front, right? We've had the the this this pandemic disruption that has, you know, kind of changed everything or at least changed our thinking in dramatic ways. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on whether we, when we emerge from the pandemic, right, is some people are, gonna, are saying that higher ed is going to be in a much more innovative position, either because it has to or because there's so many opportunities that it just has out there. Um, or do you think that, you know, so on a you know, scale of one to 10, higher ed, you know, 10 being, you know, it, it increases its innovation uh, at a max speed as a result of the pandemic, one being it just returns to where it was before. What, what's your thinking on uh, the global impact of the pandemic and higher education relative to innovation? I mean, I do think a lot of different things will happen at, at, at various uh, kinds of higher education. And so I think students are so hungry for the communal experience of a liberal arts education. The students yeah. want to be together that, uh, and learn in community. So I think those dimensions will not, people, people have, have stayed home in their basements <laughs> and done Zoom classes <laughs> and they don't want more of that. <laughs> yeah. By the same token, I also, uh, I, I do think uh, using digital techniques will also expand because I think we've all seen the positive effects so that um, you can get to know somebody well online. But I think, I think more for professional and advanced training. I mean, last summer, uh, my wife and I took a poetry course from a Canadian school. The professor was teaching from Cambridge there were 50 people taking it around the world. It was a tremendous course. And we didn't have to go to Vancouver to take it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I would actually, I'm going to take another course this summer. <laughs> and so we've also seen, I mean, I know a Washington think tank that uh, would have events and they would have maybe 150 people at an event. And this year it was all online and they quadrupled that number. Right. And so I do think it will exp expand audiences. I think faculty now, all of our faculty are used to teaching online. And I think they will enrich their courses by bringing in visitors. You read a book, you bring in the author. I think those things are much easier. Um, and I think the, so I think the online market of education will continue to expand and that will be a significant change. But I, th I guess it's forms of blended learning. Right. I mean, some of that was already going on. Our physics department before COVID had sort of flipped their courses so that most lectures were given online. And that's the way medical education has gone. And so right. when you come together, you're doing something practical or you're discussing. Right. So I, th I think you'll see that accelerate. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you you know, some recent survey data that was done by Inside Higher Ed and the Student Voice Project that Kaplan is a sponsor of. Uh, this is a survey of 2,000 currently enrolled college students. You're right. Vast majority are eager to be back to the classroom, back to campus, you know, done with the Zoom uh, calls. But however, uh, the majority, uh, it's over 50% over of students continue to say they want to also have the option to have the lecture recorded so they can go back and review it or have the option to do the class online, you know, so that for whatever reason, flexibility, I'd like to do it over the summer, I'd like to graduate faster, right? So, so I think this hybridity is going to remain, even though the appetite to return in-person learning is certainly strong, there's that desire to kind of keep several of these pieces in place. So, you know, I think that's going to encourage a lot of new opportunities. It may encourage opportunities that uh, that actually in some ways could help lower the cost of delivery and increase the quality. I don't know that those are mutually exclusive either. So um, I, I do no. think, I mean, it will be interesting if um, quality co colleges and universities develop online programs, which could, could be much tailored pro undergraduate programs, which could yep. be delivered at high quality at far less expense. I haven't right. seen, I mean, Georgia Tech has done that wonderfully with master's degree and others have. Yeah. The question is, is anyone gonna step up to take their resources 
to provide a premier degree uh, for students at a much uh, right. at, at a much better cost. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, look, I'm a fan of that kind of thinking and innovation, right? I think at the bachelor's degree level, that's where it could really make a huge difference. You're right. There's been good examples at a master's degree level of disruptive price points and, you know, fully online master's degrees have been around for a long time now. But the high quality bachelor's degree, right, that could be at a differentiated cost, like I think that's going to be, I'm hopeful that that's one of the big breakthroughs that comes out of the out of the pandemic. And you know, it relates a little bit to the work that we've been doing together between Wake and, and Kaplan, especially as we think about the, the online courses that we've developed together for, uh, for high school students. You know, the, the net promoter score ratings of those courses are higher than Netflix and Apple ratings. So students clearly love them. You know, they're done by Wake faculty who are some of the most dynamic faculty. There are subjects that are super interesting to students with a bent towards you know, what could you do with this? You know, what kind of career or profession you could be in? And, and there's a hike. So there's super high production quality that students take asynchronously, uh, amazing video, et cetera. But they also get live mentors from upper class wake students. So I mentioned this because it's an example of really well done, high quality online education that still has a personal human touch to it. And of course, rave reviews from the students that are going through it. So I'm not talking about a degree program, obviously, but there's a semblance of what you're talking about there that, that we've already learned together. Yeah, it opens up new opportunity. It means in an urban community or a rural community far away, there's just much greater access right. uh, that students will have uh, in the future. Yeah, and you can certainly see a world where there's a, there's a cohort of students that desire to be on campus, that that's exactly what they wanna do. And you could also see a world where, you know, the student who either can't afford it uh, or has other reasons why they prefer not to, to still be able to get, you know, a quality degree from a top ranked institution. There's definitely a market out there, uh, let alone to think about, you know, what that might mean at, at an international level, a global student level. So interesting things ahead. And uh, I'm curious, as you think about advice for other institutions, right, you know, I think about uh, the, the key points you've mentioned, you know, hire for the talent. and create roles that, that are senior level roles that are focused on this and establish a committee of the board of trustees where they're constantly engaged in it. Um, I mean, in a way from those things, I think you've created a culture of innovation now at Wake, right? That it's spilled out into some of the faculty and academic deans. And now there's, I can kind of sense it, right? When I talk to various folks at Wake, there's a little bit of a, there's an energy and a frenzy around it and it's creating new ideas, right, in addition to some of the opportunistic things that, that are out there, what would be your advice uh, if you were taking the helm of another institution instead of retiring, right, or advising another president who really wants to drive innovation, what would be some of the key points? I mean, you, certainly you can double down on those things and say, you know, that would be what I recommend, but um, there had to have been some challenges to this. Like, did you have resistance, you know? There are clearly, they're clearly built in tensions. Yeah. And actually, one of the reasons at Wake, I think we've been able to innovate is because we're also in, in certain ways very traditional. And that is we honor faculty for their teaching. Yeah. And we say in, in that we're, we're radically traditional. We, we, we say we're not going to be the we're not just going to up the scale and just want researchers. We want the most brilliant faculty we can get who have deep commitment to students. Yeah. And that's a that's a that's deep in our DNA. And so to, to reinforce certain distinctives, it's not just everything is being innovated. Right. It's it's more given our core mission. How can we do things better? Right. How how can we uh, do things that enrich that mission? And and I mean, higher education does have a tendency to just do things the same old way. Right. Yeah. To, to, and, and to think that's. And each institution has their distinct way. And you say it's sort of incomparable because, it's, you know, in, in our case, isn't that the Wake Forest way? So, I mean, another dimension of this, I've always felt you have to compare yourselves with the best. You, you, you can't just say that you're good. It, it's Don Keogh, the president of, of Coca-Cola, who I who was a chairman of the board at Notre Dame, said to me one time, admit your problems. You'll never improve. <laughs> 
if, if, if you say all is well. I, mean, I think yeah. we, our education in any unit of it ought to try to say, oh, things are well. I mean, admit you if you're a B, you'll never get to an A if you don't <laughs> right. start where you are. Yeah. And so um, trying to find those niches that are acceptable. I mean, there, there are things that I might want to innovate at Wake that I, that I, I could never do because faculty wouldn't accept it. So you do have to pick, um, you, have to, you have to underscore certain conservative values and you have to pick where uh, opportunities are. Right, now I think that's wise advice. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't put the, you know, the gas down on the pedal too hard uh, and accelerate too fast, right? And then it, I, I presume that, you know, once you take a couple of those steps and there's some success from a couple of those steps, you know, thinking about career and personal development office at Wake, you know, I'm sure it wasn't widely popular among everybody at the beginning, but, uh, but now, you know, one of the signatures of that, which I found really interesting that a lot of other schools are still struggling to do is that, uh, is that Andy Chan and, and Heidi Robinson, one of the faculty there, developed really well done academic courses around career and personal development. And Wake is awarding academic credit for those, right? So that to me is a really big example of, uh, of where there was some probably at the start non-academic innovation that got enough credibility because of its rigor and quality and, and whatnot, where the faculty said, yeah, th these, are, these are worth Wake credit, right? I want to mention one other innovation we've done, which in some ways is radically traditional. And that is we've started a major program in leadership and character. Hmm. It's led by a wonderful young uh, scholar uh, named Michael Lamb, and also a colleague of his, uh, Kenneth Townsend. Both were Rhodes Scholars. They knew each other there. And um, in a sense, that fits into the DNA of Wake Forest, educating the whole person. And, and issues of intellect and character. But yeah. once again, ha having a distinct kind of program that is, is fresh and innovative, but it underscores what has been a traditional distinctive. Right, that's another great example. I mean, they, you know, they just, they keep flowing, right? In the, in the pattern that you guys are in right now. And one of the things I've always said is, as I think about institutions that, that I'm interested in building partnerships with, you know, people ask, oh, well, you know, are you trying to work with big publics or small privates or elite institutions or, you know, they, they'll think about institutional typology as they ask that question. And I always say, no, none of those actually matter. You know, we've, we've always tried to sort to institutions that have visionary leaders, visionary leaders that have alignment with their board and senior cabinet to some degree with clearly articulated goals around growth and innovation. And there's a lot of ways to measure that, right? Diversified revenue, actual enrollment growth of degree-seeking programs, non-degree-seeking program growth, right? But there's no doubt in my mind that that is the formula for success. You know, you look at Michael Crow in Arizona States and, you know, any, any examples of institutions that have been really innovative, it started with the spark of the talent, right? The, the leader, the leader who brought in other leaders. And so the, the reason why I mention that is I think it's encouraging to to say to higher ed, right, the right leadership could, could conceivably take any institution to new heights. And on the flip side, to just assume that you're going to be great because you're a certain type of institution or a highly ranked institution, that's probably not always, you know, a, a sure bet either. Right. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm such a firm believer that getting the, 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 the right people, I mean, in my experience, I've seen colleges in, in both at Notre Dame and here, which were dispirited and you would say dysfunctional and you get the right leader and, and with a couple of years that can completely be turned around. Yeah. And I, and I think in a university where authority is distributed, in some ways leadership is more required than in a more hierarchical organization. That is a terrific phrase and framing to end on, Nathan. Uh, I, I, there, there's nothing more we need to say. I thought that was perfect. Um, first of all, congratulations on your incredible career. Uh, second, I look forward to working with you going forward. Uh, best wishes to, to Wake Forest, obviously, and, and all the different dimensions it does. And, um, and next week, for those of you who are listening, I'll, uh, I'll have Jamie Marisotis with me, the CEO of Lumina Foundation and author of the new book, Human Work. So we'll have another great conversation. But uh, once again, thank you, Nathan. It was great to chat with you today. Great. Thank you, Brandon.